doing? So I'm sitting with Blair Imani. Hey, how are you doing? Salam. Salam alaikum. I'm sure I, I found my best to pronounce it correctly. Oh, no so problem. So I'm a convert. I'm, I'm also working on it. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. And I know you from Street Me DC. You come to our events. You are a model, an activist, a newly found activist. You are the executive, direct, executive director of Equality for Her, which is a nonprofit that does what? So the nonprofit, um, and that's kind of, well, let me back up. So when I had the idea, I wasn't like, oh, I'm going to start a nonprofit. Right. Oh, it's, you know, going to have this mission and purpose. I was just really frustrated because, you know, being a black person in the South and the discussions, and I went to, that's when I started it, when I was at LSU in the South. Okay. Um, I was like, why are all these discussions about women's rights having to do only with white women? Like, right. there are so many different facets. And before I had converted, it also, like, was very exclusive of people who are Muslim. Right. So I was really frustrated, and I was like, I need this space. So um, I, like, got onto WordPress, and I, like, registered the domain name, and it just kind of evolved from there. Um, but now we have, like, a lot of different events. Like, we have Femme Film Festival, right. um, where we show different, you know, like, films that have to mm -hmm. do with them identifying folks, right. issues um, that, you know, are relevant to women folk. And... Uh, we also have a series called Femme Founders, which I really like because I get to like collaborate with all these awesome people and just like talk about like people really enjoy when you get to talk about them and the work right. that they do. So it's just right. it's great to be able to collaborate with folks. So we're here to talk about not only your positive work, but the fact that you protested a fair amount, from what I can tell. And you went to Baton Rouge, Louisiana about a week after Philando Castile and Alton Sterling were murdered. I'm going to say murdered. I'm not going to say, I'm going to say that. I'm going to say murdered for the sake of it. And you were arrested. I, we just spoke about this off camera, but I know you said you had no thoughts of no intention, no like idea that like, oh, if I get arrested, I'm going to do this. It was, from what I can tell from the pictures that I've seen, that was the face of pure fear. Absolutely. Sim simply based on not just you being the three demographics of black, female, Muslim. It's just the fact of you being arrested. You had no idea what was going to happen, just as a human being. So, I mean, would you mind? I don't want to have to make you bring up all these Oh, no, totally. It's fine. Mind? I've been actually talking about a lot. It's helping <laughs> me process uh, what happened. But um, I was working with some students there, mm -hmm. and I was just trying to, like, mentor folks. I had done a couple, like, a lot of organizing when I was at LSU. I graduated in August 2015, so... Thank you. I had I was like I'm just gonna like you know kind of like pick it up where I left off, but I also want to bring in other organizers so that people can lead, people can become leaders. So I'm you know not trying to dominate or anything. Right. That was like one of the main criticisms of folk like Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. who'd like come in and like handle everything, right. and I never wanted to be accused of that. So um, I went down. I tried to help make press releases, mm -hmm. get people in contact with media, um, stuff along you know th those lines. Right. Um, the protest, the actual, like, you know, the planned protest mm -hmm. went really well. We had, like, the streets blocked off with the police. People were taking pictures with police. Mm -hmm. You know, it was great. Um, all, you know, that, like, great propaganda. Right. And right. Um, so after that, I think people kind of felt frustrated, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, it's like street meet, you know? Like, when street meet's over, right. it's just people like, are like, what are we going to do next, you know? Yeah. Right. And so, uh, especially because we were there for such, like, a serious purpose, mm -hmm. people wanted their voices to be heard, and they wanted to express themselves. Um, we were accused of trying to get onto the freeway, but that was not even in the realm of possibility right. or idea, you know? Um, but we kind of, we were just talking amongst ourselves, like, what, could, what should we do next? We want to march. Mm -hmm. We wanted to march all the way to the BRPD headquarters, but that is very far. And so we were like, okay, let's be more practical. Maybe we'll march to LSU, which was a lot closer. Mm -hmm. And when things tend to affect LSU, um, I don't know if you know about Baton Rouge, but it's pretty segregated. Mm -hmm. um, so the north half is uh, predominantly black, and then the, the southern half, where, which encompasses LSU, mm -hmm. is uh, more white. And so when things that happen in the black community start to affect the southern area of Baton Rouge, people start paying attention. So right. I thought that would be a really good um, tactic for us to use to like march on the sidewalks to right. LSU. And by the time we had kind of like decided what to do, we were flanked on all sides by police. And it was just, you know, a couple cop cars at first. Mm -hmm. You know, I was like, we could just walk around them, you know? Right. We could just walk on the sidewalk, you know? Um, and I think people were kind of getting a little bit scared. Like, we were already pretty subdued to mm -hmm. begin with, um, especially, like, you know, in light of all of the things that happened in Baton Rouge, profiling, right. um, racism. Mm -hmm. 
So we um, were kind of just stuck in the street. And I was up on um, a house. The, so if, I don't know if you've seen the pictures, but the standoff, mm-hmm. we were on one side of the street. Well, I was on the other side when it started. Right. And um, a cop car came down, or a SWAT like tank came down mm-hmm. uh, France Street. And I saw them. Uh, so there was a, a young woman in the front of the SWAT car, and they were just, like, driving slowly into her. And she was, like, trying to stand her ground, you know, like, stand for something. Right. She was, all, like, she was also standing with, I think, about, uh, like, 10, 15, 10 white women mm-hmm. who had, like, taken it upon themselves to protect the black folks in the group. Okay. They were like, we're going to take the streets. Right. Every, like, black folks get on the sidewalk. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was really admirable. Um, so they grabbed her, they brought her around, and by this time I'm on Periscope. I'm like... Right, right, right. I'm like, somebody else has to see Yeah, and so right. I'm getting, like, all these comments, like, what happened? What's happening? What's happening? Mm-hmm. And I was, like, trying to focus on that and kind of, I guess, detach myself from it. Mm-hmm. But I was already, like, in tears and hyperventilating. Right. But that didn't happen until I saw them drag her around, beat her, and then I saw this guy with a camera, mm-hmm. and maybe because it was also street me, I was just, you know, like, I feel for these guys who are just out here trying to, you know, make a living... Mm-hmm. With their cameras, um, kind of just document what's happening. Right. They grabbed his camera, and it was a very nice Nikon. And I was like, no, you know, right. the camera. But then they also, like, brought him to the ground, and I thought that they had shot him. So I'm crying. I'm hyperventilating. Mm-hmm. Everybody in my, like, comments on Periscope is like, did they shoot him? Did they shoot him? Did they shoot him? Mm-hmm. And I didn't know, and I actually just talked to him, uh, yeah, earlier today. Right. And we were just talking about, like, how he can use his photography to keep bringing light to this issue. But, mm-hmm. like... When I saw him later in the jail, I was like, are you okay? And he was like, who, who, who are you? You know, but right. I was like, I thought that you died. Right, you know? exactly. Um, and so we just backed away. Um, I was there with my partner, my other friend, Selassie. Mm-hmm. And I kept, if you, like, hear the audio from the, the first 10 minutes, I'm just like, where's Selassie? Where's Akeem? You know, right. asking where people are. Because I was so afraid. Selassie is from uh, the Bay Area. He's right. a activist out there. And I was so afraid he was going to be, like, you know, I'm from California, too. I was right. afraid he was going to be, like, bold in a way that cops, white folks in the right. South, are not used right. to. Right. Exactly. And he was going to get shot. And right. so that felt like a very immediate fear. Um, the whole time, my mom was in the church parking lot where the march began, mm-hmm. um, in her car, ready to go. She was like, anything happens, anything, like, pops off, ready to go. You know, right. my mom's from South Central, so she's right. very much like, I have a game plan, right. you know? Right. Like, the exit strategy has you know, like, decided. Yeah, and I was like, but mom, why would we need you know, nothing's going to happen. I had given speeches on how to protest, Mm -hmm. civil disobedience. I felt like I was so equipped. Um, And we were really out there, you know, once um, they started, like, shouting orders at us, we were trying to, my partner and I usher people across the street. Mm -hmm. He had a sign that said Black Lives Matter, and on the back of it was the number to call if you get arrested. So everybody thought he was just out being there defiant. He was like, no, write this number on your arm, memorize this number, memorize the number of your, like, five closest friends because nobody knows anybody's number now but um so we were just doing that and I was trying to make sure that he was safe because he would be so busy trying to stop people from saying you know like f the police he would like I I was afraid that the cops were going to think that he was provoking something that he was going to get shot so I was just like trying to protect him Mm -hmm. um and so that went on and up until they charged us Mm -hmm. um like they just it was like a wall um, two other SWAT tanks came from either side. So it was just like three walls. We were right. up against the house. I was actually up against the fence on her lawn and there was just nowhere to go. Mm-hmm. And I was like, we were holding each other's hands and like, we were just like drenched in sweat from adrenaline right. and fear. And I kept saying, Akeem, they're going to hurt us. They're going to hurt us. And he's like, no, we're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. And I was like, how, you know, right. but then I turn around and I see them like, yards away from me and I was like do I drop to my knees I don't want to approach them I don't want to get shot I don't want to get shot I don't want anybody to get hurt um and so I just like froze and next thing I know I'm being dragged on the ground Mm -hmm. and I hear an officer say really give it to her and I'm like are they talking smack and arresting like what I mean I knew it was bad but like just the antagonism it made no sense like Mm -hmm. this isn't a football game I'm not an opposing team what the heck And so um, they put the zip ties on, my hand turned purple in like seconds, and I just kept screaming. And so if you also see that video, which is awkward because it's been like MSNBC and stuff, it's just me screaming as I'm getting dragged out of the crowd, which is kind of awkward. But I mean, I've seen the pictures and I can can hear it. Yeah. I can, like, I've I've been met on more than one occasion and I know how your voice sounds, so I can only picture what it sounds like when you scream. It was really hard because, like, 
uh, I, I work in New York also. I was on the subway and I heard somebody watching the video, like somebody I don't know. Oh. And I was just like, oh gosh, oh right. no, <laughs> you know? That's, that's kind of like, I hear myself. Yeah, like and I didn't even have time to, like, process what had happened. Right. Um, so from that, you know, like, they, they uh, processed us. And uh, from then on, except for, you know, like, a couple of incidents, like, I was maced in the jail. Ooh. It was, we really just tried to make the, the best of the situation. Mm-hmm. Um, but we were in a pink holding cell, which I thought was hilarious. Like, <laughs> why does the women's cell have to be pink? Have to be pink. Because, like... I've done a lot of, like, research on, like, how, you know, like, they make pink razors and, like, yeah. it's a whole industry. But I was like, really? Jail? Like, like does it have to be pink? Does it have to? So we uh, we called it the Barbie dream cell. Uh-huh. And the guards were so done with us. Like, they were trying not to laugh and humor us, but it was funny. So I mean, she they were laughing. Exactly. You got to judge you and everything. Exactly. Um, I told a joke from that movie Life when we had to eat. I was like, you going to eat your, your cornbread? Corn yeah, no. <laughs> and I made the guards laugh and stuff. But, um... It was just, we were trying to find community in that, mm-hmm. in that experience. Um, and, like, I, I text the women I was, like, in the holding cell with, like, almost every day mm-hmm. or on Facebook. And I feel, like, such a connection to them, even though I've known them for, like, less than a day. Right. Um, but I think, like, overall, um, the experience kind of taught me a lot about humanity because mm-hmm. the people who were the nicest in the jail, and I don't know... Like, I don't know everybody's charges who were in the jail, but the people who were the nicest happened to have, like, the most violent crimes. Uh, One woman who, like, gave me her shirt because it was freezing in the jail, she was charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon and grand theft auto. She was a sweetheart. And I was like, wait, let me back up. Why am I expecting her? To be evil. Exactly. And I'm like, whoa, that's the problem. That's the whole reason that this is happening. Right. <laughs> um, that's the whole reason that this is happening. People assume these traits and characteristics of us, and right. we're all born innocent, and we're all born whole. Right. And society takes parts away from us right. um, that turns us into something that we didn't start out as, but we can also change. So it just like you know made me think about a lot of different things. Um, but I don't think I I regret it. Um, that's good. That you- Okay. Yeah, because it happened, but uh, I do really value, like, the learning experience that I've taken from it, I guess. I mean, you being an ex-felon, <laughs> what's next for Blair Line? Um, so... What do you want to be next for Blair Line? I don't think that I have, like, even a choice anymore, which is kind of cool, you know? Like, you go your whole life, and I'm only 22, like, trying to right. be like, what am I, like, what's my purpose, you know? And now I really feel like I can't. You might have found it. Yeah, you, you know. Have, you might have found it. Um, I my friend called me uh really early in the morning was like I just heard your name on M- on uh, MSNBC and I was like, really? You're joking? Right. I was like, stop right. trying to like you know hype me up. I know you didn't. Um, but then I looked at the clip and yeah, they were like activist Blair Armani and I was like, ooh, you know that's really <laughs> right. cool. Um, and so I did a panel in New York uh with my friend Kiar Morrison and uh his. Him and his sisters founded this organization mm-hmm. called Voice, and it's oh, like... Oh, that was the Raise Your Voice Forum. Yeah, gotcha. and so that was a really awesome forum. Um, it was also really sad because, like, a lot of the kids who came to us were basically asking, like, how do I survive a police encounter? Oh. And there's literally nothing. Like, we saw the video of the what? man in Florida who was, like, mm-hmm. literally on the ground, and I thought... Completely up. I was like, if I... I thought about that the whole time during the protest. I was like, maybe if we all just lay on the ground, or, you know, like, um, the very iconic scene in Selma where everybody's, like, you know, in front of the voter registration officer, right. just, like, arrest us. And right. I was like, we could do that, but apparently it doesn't matter, you know? Um, yeah. There's a really big problem with our system, and so that was really hard to be honest with the kids and just be like, you know, I can't tell you something that's going to save your life. Right. But I can try to, you know, help you change policy, mm-hmm. be vocal, um, and have a community, because... If I can't tell these kids to like how to be safe, I can at least try to like influence the way that they look at themselves in their community. Right. They can love themselves. They can love their community. Like if we could, you know, if there could be like less homophobia mm-hmm. before we could end police brutality, that would be a win. You know what I mean? Right. Like it's all steps towards everybody being free and liberated. But um, after I did that panel, I got an email from one of my like colleagues at LSU asking me to speak at uh, University of Louisville for their Black History Month. And I was like, 
what? Like, I freaked out. And so um, I'm probably going to be doing that. I just need to get the dates. And then uh, the John Jay School of Criminal Justice also asked me to speak. So it's really exciting. Um, And it's funny because everybody's like, oh, well, you know, that's, like, Blair's famous. And I'm like, no, I'm, like, constantly just really happy and really excited that, like, my life has taken this step. But um, I just feel really blessed. I mean, that's that's an amazing thing. I mean, you've done this at 22, and a lot of people didn't really start doing it until the 30s. Well, that's the other thing. I think, like, recently that's been the case. Mm-hmm. But um, people I grew, I grew up with, um, Dr. Terrence Roberts, yeah. you know, like the Little Rock Nine, the people who yeah, integrated yeah. schools. Mm-hmm. I remember looking at my textbook and being like, he lives across the street from right. us. And he, t- he spoke to me about how he did that when he was, he volunteered, I think he was 14 or 15. Mm-hmm. And I remember, like, being 12 and being like, I need to get my shit together. Right. Because he was doing this at 14. He's in history books, you know, and he's right. had a very like amazing career since then. Mm-hmm. But I really felt compelled to start young. And so I, I did like a little bit of organizing, but um, I mean, I don't know. It's, I, didn't, I didn't think that it would escalate this quickly, I guess. Yeah, escalation is a good thing. Unless it's police. Oh, that's not that far. Yeah. We have to have another conversation. That's another conversation. Um, but the other thing that I did recently that mixed reviews from the public. <laughs> okay. Um, I held a I, I helped organize a vigil in the same way that I held I helped organize the protest for Alton Sterling. Okay. Um, but for the police officers who were killed. Gotcha. And everybody's like, Why? You don't need to apologize for that. I'm like, right. I'm totally aware, you know. But the a lot of news agencies or like outlets are saying Black Lives Matter protesters caused this. And right. I was like, actually, Black Lives Matter is going to, we're going to embrace the police. Mm-hmm. We're going to try to, you know, like hold, lift up their humanity and right. hopefully that will be reciprocated. Right. But a lot of folks are just, you know, like, she's a police apologist, more proof that she's in the FBI. Oh, no. But on the other hand, I've had like a lot of people who, like one guy like sent me an email, mm-hmm. which was like really amazing. Cause I put my email up, like uh, I may, put a post on Facebook that said, a lot of people are confused about who I am. Right. I'm open to criticism, and I want to learn, you know? Right. Like, it was very vulnerable. And I was like, I'm going to get all this hate mail and threats. Probably. But this guy, he sent me an email, and he saw that picture, the one where you, like, you could tell immediately it was fear. You also right. recognized my humanity. Mm-hmm. He thought it was anger the first time he saw the picture. Wow. So he was like, you know, I had gone from condemning mm-hmm. you and everybody associated with protests and Black Lives Matter right. to a week later, like, literally a week later, seeing that same picture with a different headline and realizing she just wants violence to end. Right. And she's going to protest and she's also going to organize healing spaces for people. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, wow, I changed one person's mind. That's worth it, you know? But um, that was just, like, really cool. That really made it, like, made all the criticism and just, like, having to deal with the media and stuff worth it, you know? (laughs) <laughs> Let's see what you do at 25. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I can't run for office yet because I'm too young, but I want to. <laughs> <laughs> you'll, you'll be on somebody's like, board of directors or something at some point. Thank you so much for coming and interviewing with me. This is a scary concept, but this is my, good, this is my first interview ever. So thank awesome. you so much. Thank you for having me. No problem, no problem. And we out of here. Awesome. And they can check you out where? Hmm? At your website my is. website. Oh, I just fixed up my website. Yeah, I saw see it. it. Too. <laughs> and your website is blairmoney.com. blairmoney.com. Check it out, guys. See ya.